Welcome to the Daily Briefing. So much to get into. Pot stocks are on a tear. The Consumer Price Index came out today. Fed Chair Powell made his remarks about the future of monetary policy and the economy. Uh, there's so much to talk about. And to make sense of that and more, we are joined by Real Vision editor Max Weethy. Max, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Jack. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the other side of the, the table, the virtual table today. Uh, so, you know, where do you want to start? Um, I think I want to start with an area that's close to your heart. Um, pot stocks, some mar marijuana stocks, I'm talking um, companies like Tilray, um, uh, um, Canopy Growth, have been on an app, they are, they are uh, riding the rocket ship, um, and uh, particularly Tilray. And Max, I know you are an investor in this space, um, so what do you make of this price action other than the fact that you're, I'm sure you're overjoyed? Uh, yeah. So yeah, full disclosure, I do own a, a handful of cannabis stocks and I have to say, uh, you know, Todd is God. So Todd Harrison, a Real Vision contributor has been the, the guy who has really been, you know, e educating me on this. And uh, as much as I'm going to try and, and steal some of his insight today, he is coming on Real Vision next week to talk about this, considering the massive run that we've seen since he came on with with uh, TG back in in the end of 2020. And yeah, what, what you're seeing right now is really just an incredible uh, run in these stocks really across the board. But interestingly, um, it's the Canadian stocks that are running, which doesn't really make sense because the the backdrop upon which much of this, you know, price action is being attributed is the deregulation or I guess, you know, the regulation of the space here in the United States. And, and the fact that, that we're slowly opening, there appears to be bipartisan support for um for, for legalization here in the U.S. And you would think that U.S. stocks would be running. And Todd uh, specifically highlights the MSOs, which are the multi-state operators. So in the U.S., obviously, we got we have 50 states and there are different rules around uh, cannabis in each state. And so there are certain operators that have, um, have exposure to more than just one state and they're, they're set to, to grow and to take advantage of this, this opening uh, of the kimono. And well, he advises an ETF, MSOS, and you you brought up a chart earlier that shows that MSOS since November 13 is is only up 187 percent, whereas uh, Tilray I think is up 813 percent. That's that's yeah, yeah, Max. Actually, it's um 87 percent versus 713. It's factored to 100, not percentage. You you know how I feel about that, Jack. You know how I feel about that. Um, so yeah, 87 percent. Which incredible run, considering you know we're talking about a three month time span. Um, but but Tilray is absolutely running, and and some of that has to do with uh, Todd had a, a newsletter that came out today, and he sort of gave uh, a couple of reasons for it. One is the greater fool, which is people who just don't know the difference. Um, two is that a lot of U.S. institutions can't really trade into the U.S. stocks yet; they they're just not allowed to, and that this is just a one option to play the trend, and so that's where the money is going. And three is sort of like. There will be some sort of cross-border effect, and and the Canadian stocks may may benefit from the same sorts of um, same sorts of things that are happening on, on the U.S. side that the U.S. stocks will. But on its face, it it doesn't really make too much sense. So um, yeah, I mean that that sector has been absolutely ripping, and and personally, you know, my take on it is uh, there there it, it's it's part of the you know like small cap. Uh, reflation trade that ha has kind of played out. But at the same time, um, there is a longer term growth story there. So even if this trade sort of unwinds and, and we don't see, you know, the Russell outperforming um, as we have recently, uh, you know, I still sort of believe in these stocks. And so, you know, I'm, I'm building up cash positions rather than um, thinking I'm going to sell these if things go down, you know, I I'm building cash to, to sort of take advantage of of the inevitable dips that will happen. Because when you have runs like this, like there will be a pullback. It has to happen. Um, so you know, that's that's what I'm paying attention to. And, and to sort of give some, some more clarity to why it doesn't really make sense, uh, Todd, in his newsletter, he, he put out um, some work that a guy by the name of Sammy J did on Twitter, which if you look at the, the year for 2021, Canadian, um, Canadian cannabis stocks are, these are, Stocks that are all above three billion enterprise value, you know, they're trading at 19 times um, enterprise value to revenue, whereas U.S. stocks are at at 9.1 times. 
Um, and then if you go enterprise value to EBITDA, U.S. stocks 25 times, uh, Canadian stocks 97 times. Uh, go to 2022, um, you have U.S. stocks at 6.8 times enterprise value to revenue, Canadian stocks at 13 times enterprise value to revenue. Um, and same thing in, in EBITDA, you know, U.S. stocks at 17 times, Canadian stocks at, at 53.6 times. So if the U.S. really is the growth story, that's where it's all going to happen. You would think that, that that gap is going to close at some point. Um, and, and but then it gets back into Wall Street bets. Uh, you know they have they have turned towards cannabis. So you you can't deny that that there is some meme factor going on. And look, it, it's a meme. They the can the Canadian stocks were out there first, and so that's what that's what people are are talking about. They they haven't learned fully about what's going on in the U.S. So you know when when that gap is closed, I don't know, but I, I will be patient. Uh, Todd Todd has said you know you got to have a uh, got to have the diamond hands. Uh, for these for these cannabis stocks, so yeah, I think paper hands uh, get burnt, and the, the diamond hands are where it's at. Just to give color to what you said, um, just in this chart that we're we're going back to, the stock that is up the most by far is Tilray, which I think is it's an American de uh, deposit receipt, but it, it is a Canadian company. And if if I recall correctly, this was essentially the the poster child of the of of, of a, being a bubble stock during the uh, cannabis bull market. Um, of, of 2017 and 2018. My my take, my play, the reason that you know I am invested in those MSOs um, is that you know, that's those are the companies that are going to be operating in the U.S. If the story, the reason that the money is pouring into the sector is that you know the U.S. is going to be open for business, then I want to be in the companies that are open for business in the U.S. The largest consumers in the world uh, of this, and you know there's. There is some incredible opportunity, I think, for uh, investors like myself that don't have I don't have the uh, the restrictions that institutions might have to get in front. It's the same sort of wall of money argument that that there that is being made for Bitcoin, which I think is a a great transition to what we you know have seen this week from Bitcoin. Obviously, you know, um, Elon Musk uh, announced uh, that. That Tesla had invested in Bitcoin, we saw a big run up, and and Bitcoin sold off a bit today. We're still at, I, I think, you know, who knows where we are at, at the time of filming, but at last I saw it was like up over forty four thousand. So not a, a major, you know, sell off by any means, but um, certainly it has affected some Bitcoin vehicles more than others. So you know, a, Max, you're really, you're really teeing me up here. Yeah, yeah, plenty of different ways to play it. So you, you pointed out that MicroStrategy has had just like an incredible down day on on news or not news, but on the price action of Bitcoin. So talk to me a little bit about what you've seen over time with MicroStrategy as the ultimate Bitcoin trading sardine. <laughs> well, I, I want to hear a metaphor, but sure. So I was just checking uh, within the S&P, which were the stocks that were up the most and which were down the most, it's just to give me a sense of, of where the market was at. I decided to zoom out a little bit and check at the uh, the, the Vanguard All Market Index. So um, basically, essentially all all equities. And the one that was down the second most, 19%, was Micro Strategies. And this is you know, a technology company that notably uh, was at the Vanguard of putting Bitcoin on their corporate balance sheet. And as as you can see. Um, with MicroStrategy on this chart being in the blue and Bitcoin being in the red, uh, MicroStrategy has paid off by uh, investing in Bitcoin. But interestingly enough, you know, Bitcoin pull had a had a, um, a mi minor uh, pullback today, but it was MicroStrategy that was down 19%. So I'm just looking at the at the volatility profile and, and looking at the daily change of MicroStrategy versus Bitcoin. And you know, again, Bitcoin is in red. And MicroStrategy is in blue. It's it being down 19.7% um, today. But if the if I didn't know which was which, it would be hard to tell which one's Bitcoin and which one's MicroStrategy. They're both so volatile. Yeah, but you can also see that blue spike going up at times when going up above the red uh, spike. So it is going both ways, which is why I said you know it might be the the ultimate Bitcoin trading sardine, which is just something that somebody said to me. You know, the, these sardines are for trading, not for eating. Um, and yeah, I talked to I talked to Warren Irwin last week on Unreal Vision Live, and we were talking about the uranium cycle. And he was saying, look, there, there are about twenty uranium companies. Like when, if, and when uranium really starts to run, like that number is going to explode. And you can make good money in those other companies. But he's like, I wouldn't own any of them. They're great for trading, and I he 
I, I'm, I'm talking from his perspective, he will own them and will, will participate in some ways, but he's not going to you know, own them in the same way he might a mind that he actually believes in the fundamentals and understands. And so, you know, same thing can be said for, for companies that are exposing themselves to Bitcoin. That doesn't mean, uh, you know, that you, you can, you can get exposure in lots of different ways, but, you know, make sure you have the right time scale. Absolutely. Um, so marijuana, uh, Bitcoin, MicroStrategy, we've covered a few of these uh, more uh, niche topics, but let's cover the bread and butter issue of the day, which is uh, Fed Chair uh, Jay Powell's speech today. What did you make of his remarks, um, and what do you think uh, that means for the economy going forward? Well, it was it was pretty much you know like holding the course. Um, I, there wasn't too much that came out. It's it's hard to believe. Uh, you know, when I first started at Real Vision, like Fed Day was like a big event, and I would I would have you know options positions in TLT things like that, and, and we would get we would get very excited about Fed Day. And now like I have to be reminded that uh, you know Powell is giving a speech and whatnot. So you know they have been pretty pretty open about you know what they want and you know they haven't really gotten the inflation that they that they say that they're targeting you know two percent is fine a little bit over two percent is fine we're not quite there we also got uh what the cpi number today mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. which came out at what like 1.4 something like that yes that was the uh year over year number which was slightly below expectations and then the month over month was 0 0.3 which was exactly at expectations so uh, that kind of moves on to our next topic, which, which is inflation and specifically reflation. Over the past six months, uh, Max, you know, you and I have heard many market participants say that inflation is just around the corner, but it hasn't really appeared yet. Um, but the assets that do well in an inflationary and reflationary environment, they certainly have been bid up. I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, the banks, um, copper, industrials. Uh, energy companies. So you know, there's a there's a chart. Um, if you look the the U.S. 10-year yield and copper, and then uh, the KB banks, KBW bank index, they have essentially traded in lockstep since August. Um, so we have had this reflationary move, this this positioning that's going, expecting inflation and growth, but we haven't seen it so much in the data. What do you make of that, Max? Well, I mean, copper makes sense to me. I actually have a question about why you included the banks on that. To me, it's it's about like yield curve steepness, and you need some level of yields to be high for the banks to to uh, take advantage of of the the steepness of yield curve. So why why did you put the banks on there as an inflation play? Um, well, I I put it uh, on there with with a yield curve play and a, a growth play. So that actually, you know, if we look at the a chart of the yield curve today. It is upwardly sloping, suggesting that um, that it's a, a positive environment for banks. Banks like steep yield curves, and generally, and they like uh, high rates. Um, but that actually, your question is a good one. It, it um, uh, makes me think of Ed's interview with Lynn Alden, which airs tomorrow, where Lynn made the case that um, if yields go up, that is bank heaven essentially for for the reasons um, that I just mentioned, because they they borrow short and they lend long, but if um, inflation uh, roars hot and then the market, the bond market sells off, forcing the Fed to enact yield curve control, then you have inflation with low yields. So basically, real yields uh, are, you know, uh, that sinks real yields to the bottom of the ocean floor. And that is really good for gold. So uh, I think the, the gold banks and then industrial metals uh, those sort of all play within each other, and there are certain nuances into which is, is good with which, but they all hinge around um, re reflation and yield. So that's why I put those charts together. Did I did uh, that answer your question? Yeah, no, that that answers my question. It, it was a bit of a leading question, um, but but yeah, you know, you were talking about Lynn's interview. I just uh, went through Julian Brigden's interview that's going to come out next Monday, and he's you know one of the other people who's talking about inflation being just around the corner. I mean, at this point, we, we've gone around the block a few times uh, with, with how many corners we've, we've had to look around. Um, but he makes the same thing. And one of the things that he talks about, uh, which I think is really important, is the, the reactive um, nature of policy. Like, it's just 
we they they are reactive to to the market they are responsive to it and so you know that that scenario you're talking about where um yields kind of uh accelerate you know to to the upside um you know that that could cause some problems and and that's probably when we would see uh the fed step in but it wouldn't be before that they're not going to like proactively announce yield curve control uh unless something really breaks in the market so you know the, the scenario he that that's really the scenario he's looking out for, but he he kind of said, you know, should it just kind of slowly creep up? Um, that would be you know a, a sign for him to just you know add that risk to these sorts of reflation bets that that he's really bullish on. So you know, watching the same sorts of things. Nice, um, Max. While we're in plugging mode, I I, I might just mention that uh, Howard Marks peer to peer conversation with Joel Greenblatt airs on Friday, and they address some of the exact same things. And it's interesting because I typically think of those, you know, legendary investors who are very attuned, very in the weeds on their asset class. But in this, they zoomed out and talked about more macro issues. So you know, uh, Joel and Howard talked about how the U.S. should, the U.S. Uh, government and Treasury should take advantage of these record low rates and issue uh, 50 year and 100 year paper. And I think, uh, I think Howard said, if if Argentina can issue an 100 year bond, why can't the U.S.? Um, and that, that actually reminded me, I was. Uh, reading this the other day, it was it was a sort of a treatise on uh, corporate bond yields from in the early 19th century, and uh, I'll just I'll just uh, position this to you, Max. Um, in in the in 1900 to 1910, guess which guess what percentage of corporate bonds uh, had a duration over 30 years? Um, not that many. I, I just did an interview where like the 30 year mortgage didn't exist back then. So I highly doubt corporate bonds were, were much longer than what, five years. Oh, uh, you could not be more wrong, Max. Over, okay. uh, over 50% of all bonds in 1900s had a duration over 30 years. Um, and that, that really surprised me. So I agree. I think, uh, Howard Marks makes a good point. If in 1900, uh, railroads that, May not exist in, in it may not have been existed in a, in a few years could issue uh, extremely long duration bonds. Then certainly the U.S. government can issue a fifty or even a hundred year bond. So uh, that's that's just where I'm thinking, and that comes out on Friday. So uh, today we had Russell Napier, Steve Clapham. Tomorrow it's Lynn Alden. On Friday, Joel Greenblatt, Howard Marks, and then on Monday is is your interview with with uh, Julian. Yeah, I'm cut out of that, so don't don't expect to have to fast forward through my parts, uh, everybody. <laughs> well, um, Max, uh, let, let's let's uh, move on to another topic, which is it's a very hot topic that has really uh, seized the zeitgeist, and we haven't talked about it on Real Vision as much as we should, and that is SPACs a, or a special purpose acquisition uh, company, and um, you know th these have become incredibly prolific as they offer uh, companies, more nascent companies, growth oriented companies, a chance to go public without. The IPO process, where you have to have all of these filings, um, and so far it's worked out wonderful for investors and for the companies themselves. But there's a little bit of stuff uh, behind the curtain that I want to get into. Um, Max, what's your outlook on SPACs right now? Um, my outlook is borrowed from people much smarter than myself, but uh, it's basically that it's not going to stop, and and partially it's because of the returns that you would see on on this this chart that you shared with me today. Uh, it's because it is working for all of the parties involved, um, and until people get burnt, it's gonna it's gonna just keep on happening. So I, I think it's a trend that will that will continue. Um, and and the structure is is very beneficial to to both the the sponsors and the companies. It allows them to to generate a, a tremendous amount of of raise a tremendous amount of cash. And um, so you know I, I think it will continue. That doesn't mean that there won't be good companies in it, but you know anytime there seems to be like free money lying on the ground, uh, you know, and anybody's gonna anybody who's smart enough is gonna take advantage of that. And you know, bad actors are can be just as smart as as good actors. So I think you know, keep your wits about you. But uh, this this is a, a a runaway train that's gonna keep on rolling. Yes, um, and we don't know uh, when it, the train will go off the tracks. But people are having a lot of fun on the train now. Just to go back to that chart. So from uh, 20, Jan, uh, January 1st, 2019 to January 22nd, 2021, uh, SPAC investors have, have had an average gross return of 90%, which is, 
which is, so the uh, SPAC investors are, are basically the retail people who buy it once it goes public. So 90%, that sounds good. But then you realize that the SPAC sponsors have an average return of 958%. Which, which is off the charts. That is, it's, in other words, it is extremely lucrative for investors and uh, sophisticated hedge funds um, and, and investment vehicles to, uh, to, to, be, to sponsor SPACs and help bring these companies to market. So the, the incentives are all there for uh, the very, very wealthy. Yeah, and uh, well, interestingly, one of the things on there is I see the post-merger buy and hold investor returns versus the IPO index. So the average person who buys a SPAC versus buys an IPO actually underperforms an IPO. So it's great for the companies, it's great for the sponsors, but compared to for the retail investor who is choosing between, you know, they want to get access to new companies, new trends. Um, if you're choosing between a company that, you know, maybe did it the hard way and went and IPO'd or a company that did it with a SPAC, um, you're actually underperforming uh, that, that IPO index. Yes, definitely. And especially when you look at the post-merger buy and hold investor gross returns, yeah. that is a uh, 44%. Um, so let's, Max, is there anything else uh, on your mind? I have a few final charts I want to get out of the way, but um, is there anything no, else I, on the macro landscape? Uh, no, I mean, really just that, that thing that I was talking about with, um, you know, the, the pot stocks, it, it sounds so weird to say that. I feel like pot is like what, you know, your mom calls it when she's yelling at you. You know, is that pot I smell? Um, but it, it's that, you know, these companies are benefiting from trends that are going on right now from like the, the hot, the hot market. They're, they're benefiting from that. But there is a good story, a good, you know, growth narrative that looks out further than just this current, you know, mania that's happening. And so th those are the types of sectors, the types of companies that personally I'm looking at right now, which are, you know, there is, there is a great story right now, but looking out, like I actually really believe in them. So if all the stuff that we're talking about with the markets being frothy, with the questions people have about it being a bubble, you know, I'm not worried that some of these companies are going to be the leaders on the other side. Like I, I do truly believe that. So that's, that's the type of company I'm looking at in this type of environment, um, the type of sector I'm looking at and, you know, Take take it with a grain of salt. It it it's it's what I'm looking at, and and maybe that that's not enough for everybody else. But um, you know, th that's personally what I think is is the type of thing. If if you like me are are looking around and and saying you know this is uh it's getting a little hot, getting a little frothy. Who knows how long it could go on? You know, I'm I'm going to ride it. I'm gonna I'm gonna participate, but I'm gonna do it with things that you know I actually believe in. Wise words, Max. All right, Jack. So it, it seemed to me like you were leading that you have something else you want to talk about. So so let, let's hear it. <laughs> All right. Um, well, GameStop uh, essentially uh, has, has uh, descended from its heights uh, of the, the last week. Um, but if you look at the, the options activity, uh, there still are some believers out there who are, have bought extremely out of the money options. Um, op options that expire this Friday and then next Friday at the 800 strike price. Um, so, you know, the, the uh, I, I think that the a lot of GameStop investors are uh, they're out of the money, but they're not out of the game yet. So, I, I wouldn't declare this a dead narrative uh, and just throw this story in the trash. Okay, people, in, you know, financial in the, we we in the financial media we got some good uh, headlines out of this, and now we can move on to the next story. I think this could uh, uh, recur. And we could be hearing about it again. Um, and then, if you look at the short interest as a percentage of the floats, um, it, it still remains um, as fifty percent, which is an extremely high number, down admittedly from the one hundred and forty percent. The folks on Wall Street Bets, for a while, they were saying that this data, which I'm quoting, which comes from a, a firm called S3, was faulty, and that they that's not the real data. That that they they've uh, conspired with the hedge funds in order to make it look like the shorts cover their position. Um, whereas now when I go on Wall Street Bets, I see very little about GME, um, which made me a little sad. But yeah, I just wanted to share those two, two data fit points. I, Max, I know you have somewhat of a, uh, a very different opinion on this whole GameStop affair. 
Uh, yeah, and I'll, and I'll keep that to myself for now. But you know what we were talking about about you know things being good trading vehicles. I just pulled up the one day chart, the intraday chart, and it, the difference in price between nine forty five and one thirty was thirty percent. And then if you take it from that same peak at one thirty and take it all the way down, it's down seventeen uh, percent from that high. Uh, as of where it closed, and, and now it's down another 2.93% after hours from what I'm looking at right now. So, you know, if you're a trader, if you're looking for volatility, if that's what gets you excited, there's there's still plenty of action in GameStop. Yes, definitely. I, I think a serious catalyst in uh, the price going down was, of course, Rob, Robinhood and these other uh, retail brokerages uh, stopping trading or stopping the buying of securities. That That is completely stopped for now. Um, you you look at the the uh, uh, the time series of the the volume weighted at price. You used to see all these little uh, interstices you know, indicating that uh, yeah no one could buy, no one could sell. But now um, it's it's a, essentially a fully functioning free market. So I think that uh, if there are players who want to uh, reload their guns and drive this up again, uh, it's, they they've got uh, tons of runway in front of them. Max, great to have you on the daily briefing. Uh, talk to you soon.